we should be in a position to support our position and to prove that we disagree with knowledge rather than without knowledge. And I can't imagine a more delightful example of this situation than that which relates to the Hermetic literature. For in this we have a wonderful disagreement. We have the most learned persons over a period of perhaps uh, 1800 years in violent disagreement. Each of these positions has been taken with skill. Most of the authorities have done everything in their power to ferret out uh, the facts. When we say everything in their power, we place certain provision. For it is not in the power of any person to go completely against conviction. And most of the erroneous opinions that we have in life arise from prejudice, from some bias or limitation by which it is impossible for us to think clearly and freely and to examine all facts upon their own merit alone. We are conditioned by our living, by our thinking, by our education and our environment. And these conditioning factors move in upon our thinking and frequently distort it. Therefore, if a person researching in some field belongs to a school that has strong prejudices, he has already lost his own freedom of thinking his own individual directive. We'll begin with a discussion to be found in the Stromata of Clement of Alexandria. This writer uh, was alive and at work uh, as a literary man between about 175 and 220 A.D. He belongs to the great group of anti-Nicene fathers, writing, of course, strongly from an early Christian prejudice. Yet he was living with the peoples of Egypt. He knew them, and in many instances, in most cases, there was a strong streak of honesty in the things that he stated, although there could be much bias in his interpretation of facts, he was reasonably correct on his basic facts. He describes the procession in Egypt, which apparently he had seen, a sacred ritualistic processional involving uh, the custodians and bearers of the books of Hermes. He describes how a procession of priests and savants, teachers, moved in very sacred ritualistic order, each with an appropriate symbol and wearing certain insignia indicating the department of learning over which he presided. Clement also says that to earn these distinctions of learning, it was necessary for these scribes, scholars, and priests to have memorized certain books of Hermes, some three books, some four books, some ten books. These various religious and philosophical teachers also carried emblems relating to the branches of learning over which they presided. Therefore, some of them have become masters of the medical books of Hermes others of those books dealing with statesmanship and law and the government of peoples, others still of astronomy, mathematics, navigation, and the secrets of the heavens, and the geography of the earth, still others in turn of philosophy, of the deeper mysteries of the mind, of those sciences which are speculative, inductive, or theoretic, and still others, bearing those books and insignias 
which indicated that they were students of the divine mysteries concerning the nature of God, of deity, of the state religion, of the secondary, secondary deities and tutelaries, and all things which had to do with theology. Adding together the books specifically referred to by number but not by name by Clement, we find clear statement of 42 books, divided apparently into a wide variety of subjects, in so short and simple, uh, covering practically every field of knowledge known in the ancient world. Now we have here several facts of importance. The first is that Clement writes apparently as an eyewitness uh, to these rituals taking them for granted, and his contemporaries must have known whether he was correct or not, and it is unlikely that he would have perpetrated a fraud. It would have been too easy to detect it, and some other writers would certainly have come out violently against him. The second important point is dating, namely that this procession occurred probably not later than 220 A.D., and possibly as early as 150 A.D. This gives us a kind of orientation which brings us violently into conflict with one of the greatest antiquarians of his time, Fabricus. He declares it to be his most solemn and sincere conviction that the Hermetic books could not have been written prior to the year A.D. 300. Now here we come head on into one of our um, least minor problems. Is it conceivable that Fabricus was not aware of the statement by Clement? This is almost impossible. Had he not noted it himself, someone else would have brought it to his attention. He was working at a time when literature was not as abundant as it is now. Men did not overlook source books centuries ago when these constituted practically the sum total of authority. Therefore, we try to understand why Fabricus took his position. The answer is obvious from other authorities working in the field. According to this uh, answer, Fabricus assumed that the books carried by the Egyptians in their religious processional could not have been the present books that we now associate with Hermes. Fabricus would be inclined to follow the school with which he had greatest fondness and take it for granted that the books referred to must have been primarily Egyptian, that these books must have been in the Egyptian philosophy, in the Egyptian religion, and almost certainly in the Egyptian glyphic writings. He, on the other hand, Fabricus, takes the position that the Hermetic books that we know today were undoubtedly written in Greek. Now, where we do not have many facts, positions can be strongly held. His position is sustained by the evidence of his time, but he, there were two things he didn't know. He couldn't know. One was the discovery in 1946 of the Kenoboskian Library in uh, near Luxor, about 30 miles from Luxor in Egypt. Uh, this library proves conclusively that the Hermetic books were in existence <coughs> prior to A.D. 300. And the general opinion now is that the manuscripts discovered will probably date from the middle of the third century A.D. or perhaps the beginning of that century. In other words, these books are practically contemporary with Clement of Alexandria, the man we quoted first. Now, the position that the Hermetic books had to have been written in Egyptian is also assailed by another fact, a fact which perhaps Fabricus did not adequately examined. That is, that considerably earlier, a Greek dynasty of pharaohs had taken over the administration of Egypt, and Egypt, Egypt was already passing 
or from Egyptian learning to Greek learning. This we evidence from the appearance of the Septuagint version of the Bible, which was actually uh, prepared in Greek in Egypt, uh, probably in the middle of the 4th century BC. Therefore, to say that Greek could not have originated in Egypt prior to the 4th century AD is no longer a tenable hypothesis. Also, we have another interesting point, one that we cannot overlook. The discovery of the Rosetta Stone gave us our first real clue to the Egyptian language. And it is important to us because it is a bilingual inscription in Egyptian glyphs and in Greek. Now this is important to us for two reasons. First, because this stone was cut or prepared approximately 200 BC. The second point of interest is that this stone actually carries the name of Hermes. It is one of the words, of course, in the Egyptian form, Thoth. But it also carries another very interesting uh, peculiarity by which we divide uh, the Egyptian Thothic literature from the true Hermetic structure. We most of us realize or remember that Hermes is generally referred to in the Hermetic writings as Mercurius or Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice greatest. And in some of the earlier works, this is modified a little, and he is called the twice greatest. But always this peculiar appellation of more than great accompanies the peculiar use of the term in the Hermetic literature. On the Rosetta Stone, uh, the reference to Thoth is Thoth great great. In other words, twice great. And this carries with it an implication that is so close to our hermetic problem that we cannot ignore it. Also, we know, therefore, that 200 B.C., a sufficient study had been made and a sufficient interest had been created that a bilingual inscription uh, relating to matters of importance had already uh, assumed the proportion of a necessity. And in Egypt, Greek and Egyptian were both languages needed in the administration of the state 200 years B.C. This brings uh, the next point uh, that involves itself in our peculiar uh, situation. How early could these books have been compiled? Here another group of authorities move in. The effort now being to collate or to, re to relate certain words and structure in the writings of Hermes with the existing versions of the Bible. This opens an interesting problem, and it is now generally regarded as likely from the peculiar use of terms that the author of the Hermetic works was to some degree acquainted with the Old Testament. The quotations that he appears to use, or the similarities which arise, are clearly to the Septuagint version, or the version that was actually prepared in Egypt. Also, references to the New Testament have been variously traced and implied, and this opens another interesting situation, namely that perhaps the author was acquainted with the New Testament. But the evidence to sustain this is less strong than that he was acquainted with the Old Testament. This brings another group of authorities into the picture, namely the recognition that ancient works passing downward over periods of time are frequently changed. Uh, a scribe or a translator working with a document and with certain liberty to either polish or refine the style of that document is very likely to fall into idiom, the idiom of his own time. Our outstanding example of that, of course, is the King James Version of the Bible. 
This version, prepared and published first in 1611, is a masterful translation into English. Yet any scholar examining the uh, King James Version would date it almost certainly into the opening years of the 17th century. Not because the original contents belong to that period, but because in the translation it has fallen into the idiomatic forms current at the time the translations were made. This can also have occurred in connection with the Hermetic writings. It is not at all impossible that versions or variants of these writings may have appeared at several times, and that these various editions might have been some in Egyptian, some in Greek, and that those in Greek, probably made by scholars, could easily be influenced by dominant books in the field of the literature of that time. So out of this entire rather involved and uh, at the same time interesting detective story, we come to a series of rather negative facts. Actually, no authority has as yet clearly proven his point. It is not absolutely certain that uh, words or peculiar constructions paralleling the Septuagint could not have come into the Hermetic writings at a time of their translation or transliteration from the Egyptian glyphs. Scribes and scholars could have polished the work in the temper of their own days. Nor is it at all impossible that other versions of the work may have been tampered with after the beginning of the Christian era. It is quite conceivable that efforts would be made by certain groups and certain sects to twist or move this group of literature into the Christian camp. On the other hand, certain other groups might have done everything possible to delete Old Testament parallels for various reasons. And later in the period of the heresies, each translation could be changed, even as we observe changes in the Bibles of the various sects of the early Protestant Reformation. We have therefore only one essential fact that seems to be uh, clear to us. Namely, that Clement was aware of the existence of some kind of a literature. A literature which does not exist in Egyptian glyphs in any manuscripts that we know today. He was aware of this literature as early as 175 A.D. Cicero, uh, flourishing approximately 100 B.C., also refers to the Hermetic writings. Now, shall we say that these were Egyptian works now unknown, or were they the same general body of literature that we are now concerned with? There is nothing to indicate in the remarks of Cicero that he was referring to a particular or special kind of Hermetic writing he took the attitude of referring to the subject as a corpus or body of literature. From what we are able to gather from these suggestions, and bearing in mind that uh, Clement makes no concept or claim that this ceremony had been recently introduced, or that it differed from ancient and usual practices, we, are, we gradually move the date of the Hermetic literature back until in all probabilities we have some security as early as the first or second century BC. Beyond this point we have not so great a security and we are quite possibly involved in a situation that arose after the gradual decline of the Greek academies and the motion of Greek learning into the Egyptian theater. Now why do we make a point of the difference between Greek and Egyptian in this case? Is there any reason to assume, for example, that these 
hermetic books might not be merely well-polished Greek versions of more ancient Egyptian texts. This is a moot question. Uh, in favor of it, of course, is our comparatively inadequate knowledge of Egyptian religion. A knowledge, however, which is gradually filling in. And uh, at last, our Egyptologists are beginning to worry themselves with some text other than those of the old funereal rites. We're beginning to sense something of the dignity of Egyptian literature, something that we have not known until the last 25 to 30 years. However, against the belief that these works are simply a translation of earlier Egyptian doc doctrines, there are certain facts not to be overlooked. What we know today of Egyptian religion, or what we have been able to piece together even in more recent years, would lead us to the conviction that the Hermetic books are not orthodox Egyptian texts. They represent some kind of a change. They are not steeped in the Osirian ritual of the later Egyptian religion. They are not uh, part of the great Ammonism that preceded that. They show very little indebtedness to any structure of Egyptian learning which we now possess. There is, however, as Dr. Breasted has pointed out, and a budge of the British Museum supports this position, there is great possibility that mystical or secret sects existed in Egypt at an older time, and that these sects may already have begun uh, the rationalization of their theological concepts, and that religious philosophy as philosophy may have arisen in Egypt at an earlier date than we realize and has generally been ignored because we have not recovered adequate text evidence. If, as was the case in early Christian mysticism, this lack of adequate text is simply due to the fact it was not written but was passed on as oral tradition or under obligations or, as Breasted suggests, the glyphs themselves may be susceptible of two complete systems of interpretation. We may then well be in the presence of a tradition long held orally and finally reduced to written form with the rise of the Greek uh, period of culture in Egypt. This would be consistent because the coming of Greek learning to Egypt would have justified a large part of the Hermetic corpus. In other words, for the first time, the teachings of Hermes may well have become of interest to the average Egyptian, who was beginning to be cultured in the philosophical speculations of the Greeks. Egypt was reticent in these matters because, of course, it claimed, as most ancient nations did, that itself it was the cradle of learning. It might therefore well have refused uh, to wish to accept that a foreign teaching such as Greek was of primary importance and may have attempted to prove that its own teachers and its own leaders of past times had originated this doctrine. Now let us see how that stands up because we have an interesting point here. We know that in the 6th century B.C., Nearly all Greek scholars visited Egypt. We know that Pythagoras received a large part of his education from the Egyptians. We know that Plato visited Egypt, receiving the mysteries at Sais. We are perfectly well aware that Solon in the 6th century went to Egypt. And there he became instructed in the principles of laws which he later reformed and applied to the needs of the Athenian states. All of these considerations must cause us to realize that Greek philosophy was, a, was indebted to Egypt. Yet in Greek philosophy we do not find the elements of the Egyptian religion which flourished at the time of Pythagoras or Plato. 
we do not find Pythagoras returning with a hierarchy of Egyptian deities to impose upon the Greek mind. We do not find him returning with Egyptian religious rites, ceremonies, or rituals, although Pythagoras was profoundly concerned with ritualism. From what we can generally observe, the Pythagorean system was essentially derived from the Orphic, uh, which in turn probably came in originally from the Far East. Yet here we have Greeks going to Egypt, learning many things and returning to strengthen and unfold their own Grecian system of philosophy. Is it possible then that the return of Greek philosophy to Egypt about the time of the rise of the Hermetic literature uh, was more than a coincidence? Is it at all conceivable that Pythagoras and Plato and Solon and others who made the same at that time difficult journey actually received a teaching different from that of Orthodox Egyptian religion and that in the mysteries of this uh, teaching they derived the principles of their own Greek system. If this is true, then there is no reason to doubt that the Hermetic tradition in Egypt, which in many ways is similar to the Greek, might well have been older than the Greek, and might have been communicated to those Greeks who later fashioned the Platonic and Peripatetic systems of philosophy, or even the Stoical and Cynical schools. All this gives us something else to worry about, which I think I add as a kind of a novelty, because as far as I can find out, the others have not been worrying about this point. This is a private worry of our own. There is every reason, then, to assume that being without knowledge of the actual facts involved and having only circumstantial evidence upon which to build, we cannot preclude the possibility that the Egyptians did possess the rudiments of Hermetic philosophy earlier than the rise of Greek philosophy. This would seem to be more probable inasmuch as the Greeks borrowed from the Egyptians at a time when the Egyptians were not borrowing from the Greeks. In those days when Solon visited Egypt, the Egyptian priests referred to the Greeks as children, infants in learning, and Solon was inclined to agree with them and recognize the tremendous value of being allowed uh, to become acquainted with the Egyptian system of law and uh, political structure. All these situations lead together uh, to uh, refute the belief that is advanced by one authority as a pat solution to everything, namely that the Hermetic works were compiled by an individual who was interested in both Egyptian and Greek lore, and therefore in all probability was a moderate scholar in these different fields, perhaps living late enough to also indulge in Christian speculation. These points seem unreasonable, and I think that we have to uh, recognize the probability that the so-called Hermetic tradition could have existed in Egypt without being directly involved in the state religion. It could have been a philosophical school. It could have been a group of sectaries of its of its own peculiar order, like the Essenes in Syria and the Therapeutae, also in Egypt, though belonging to an entirely different conviction from the Egyptians. <coughs> this gives us one other uh, situation that we cannot afford to overlook, however, even though it becomes a little contrary uh, to our uh, desire. We must be perfectly fair in presenting the different sides of this situation. It has been a custom since the beginning of the written word for individuals, either for prestige or profit, or to bestow unusual dignity upon some production of their own, to ascribe that production to an ancient writer. We find this all through various works. 
For instance, as late as the 18th century, a whole group of works were attributed to Aristotle, in which he had no part at all, particularly an essay on midwifery that certainly would never have been Aristotelian. But these tracts, in order to gain a quick public, uh, borrowed ancient names. Friar Bacon, Roger Bacon, was subject to the same type of uh, fabrication. And it is even uh, generally assumed today that books printed as late as 1800 were printed on old paper and old type and backdated to become more impressive. There is no way in which we can estimate what individuals will do to accomplish an end. It has been also the general experience of man that antiquity bestows authority. And wherever a subject wishes to have immediate recognition or to move into a sacrosanct position, it uh, chooses to be appended to an ancient work. <laughs> Thus, if we say that a work was written 50 years ago, uh, it does not have the same presti prestige if we say that it was written 2,000 years ago. Antiquity seems to give us a certain sense of confidence. Also, it makes a remoteness dividing the work from our common habits and dividing the author from the persons we may have known. Uh, we know what fabrications in various fields of literature have accomplished in this particular case or instance. Thus, it is always possible that the Hermetic writings were produced at some period, perhaps between the 3rd century B.C. and the 1st or 2nd century A.D., and attributed to an earlier author. This attribution may not be as completely um, dishonest also as one might think. Because even today we have a class of literature, particularly in metaphysical and mystical matters, in which various ancient persons are said to have revealed themselves or to have dictated writings or to have projected thoughts upon later writers. We have a considerable field of spiritualistic literature sustaining this position. We also have a number of minor religious movements of comparatively recent order or vintage in which the essential teachings are attributed to miraculous circumstances and remote ages. If these things come through a kind of inspiration, if an individual entrance or under the uh, pressure of vision, uh, seems to see, note, or be in contact with a remote scholar or a great teacher of the past, he may very well actually believe that some document dictated to him is actually attributable to the original author. This type of thinking we do find, and we find it quite honestly advanced. And with perhaps 18 or 1900 years of obscurity in between, it is very difficult for us uh, to clearly uh, demark these possibilities and to give them adequate consideration. I think one point is of very great interest to us, and that is that the history of Hermetic literature is loaded with a variety of unreasonable circumstances. Even after we pass out of the original Alexandrian center, where in some way this whole literature seems to have risen in this great North African melting pot of beliefs and doctrines, it moved into the Near East to involve or invite the spe speculations of the Arabs. They did a splendid job of speculating, by the way. Uh, their extravagances added to the original uncertainty have not done anything to clarify the matter. Uh, but they did undoubtedly uh, prepare commentaries and tracts, and in their own inimical style had their own revelations relating to the Hermetic uh, philosophy, so that just as we are indebted to them for a number of original uh, Christian documents, so we can definitely say that we are indebted to them for a very remarkable 
group of hermetic uh, interpretations, expansions, revisions, and even in a, a book or two that was not previously known to exist. Whether these actually were legitimate or whether they were invented, we have no way of knowing after so long a period of time. This also meant that the Hermetic philosophy returned to Europe. It returned to the Moors and through the uh, Crusades and through the increasing contacts between the Near East and European scholarship. It came back to Europe or reached Europe in a blaze of glory. It became uh, one of the great fashions and fads of the time and Hermes grew in stature to such extent that he eclipsed even Aristotle for a while and that was a considerable problem in eclipsing. Actually, however, in the interval, in its slow meanderings uh, from Egypt via Arabia and into Spain and from Spain up through southern Europe into the great centers of European culture in the medieval period, in this period of wandering, uh, the Hermetic philosophy began to change its shape, sh change its uh, presentation. Much of its so-called broadness was lost. The original books of Hermes uh, came to be regarded as merely the outer surface of a larger literature, and the entire subject gradually uh, emphasized its scientific import and became practically synonymous with medicine. Thus we have a complete literature dealing with the medical arts and, of course, one of the prime elements in medicine, chemistry. Chemistry, of course, in those days was without boundaries such as we know now. Chemistry in China, in India, Arabia, was alchemy. And alchemy was a fantastic conglomeration of ancient beliefs and modern experimentation. The alchemists were not by any means a group of quacks, nor were they an assembly of madmen. They were devout persons, serious scholars, deep thinkers. And in their thinking and in their speculations, Hermes became their patron saint. And this ancient philosophical personality ultimately dissolved to become the symbolic figure of mercury, quicksilver, a chemical element. So in his long journeys, Hermes passed from a demigod of Egypt to a medieval element. Now that was quite a trip. And in the course of this traveling, another interesting thing occurred. During the 15th and early 16th century, a brand new literature accredited to Hermes appeared. For this literature, there is no history whatever. We know beyond reason or doubt that this literature arose from original sources, perhaps not earlier than 1400 A.D. and as late as 1500. But the name of Hermes began to appear on the titles, pages, and among the emblemata of alchemy. He became accredited with the preparation of uh, chemical formulas, means of transmuting metals. He was even accredited with the discovery of gunpowder. Now this is so totally different uh, from the corpus hermeticum of ancient times that we must pause. Yet we must also remember the words uh, of Clement of Alexandria in the Stromata, where he tells us that in this procession of priests there were some who carried the symbols of medicine, chemistry, and other arts. Upon perhaps this very slender foundation, Hermes was elevated to become the patron genius of uh, medieval Hermeticism. This Hermeticism divided very definitely into two schools. One was that of the gold makers, whose philosophy was not, however, as superficial as we might think. They were convinced that there were analogies in nature and that any uh, law or pattern or process by which the regeneration of man could be achieved could also be used for the actual transmutation of base metals. 
on the hypothesis that all processes in nature have a certain uniformity and consistency. It was assumed that if man could save his own soul, thus transforming himself from a material to a spiritual creature, that he could also transform metals from the dross side of themselves to a more purified state, suitable for medicines and elixirs, suitable for the extension of life and perhaps the achievement of physical immortality. These gold makers, however, such as those who were so industriously occupied in the old street of the alchemists in Prague, Czechoslovakia, uh, these alchemists were ridiculed by another group. This other group maintained that the entire hermetic tradition, as it has now been called, dealt not with metals, but with the regeneration of the intangibles in human nature. If anything, they would have taken the position that if you can transmute metals, this proves you can transmute man. They would have reversed the polarity. They would have reversed the interest, affirming that the mere achievement of material wealth was an ignoble and unreasonable end, totally inconsistent with the divine destiny of man. These mystical gold makers then immediately began to reduce the chemical symbols and tracts and writings attributed to Hermes and other authors into metaphysical textbooks. Books inclined to, to reveal that transmutation was a kind of yoga, a kind of mystical regeneration within the human being, the man himself being the alchemical retort in which these marvelous changes might take place. And these same mystics assume that Hermes, representing Mercury, Quicksilver, representing this mysterious agent in which all elements can be reconciled, that Mercury therefore represents the reconciling power of human consciousness, or perhaps more exactly, of the human mind. For Mercury becomes the key, the master of the mystery, by means of which all things are unlocked. And the medieval man liked to think of reason as this power by means of which all mysteries could be solved, all good things could be accomplished, and the interval between man as a physical being and man as a spiritual being could be crossed or bridged uh, through reason and illumination. Now this would carry us back again to the Hermetic books by a circle. For in the Pimanda of Hermes, we have no doubt whatever that Hermes is used in this work not only as a person, but as an embodiment or personification of universal mind. So your mystical alchemist seems to have retained the Hermetic tradition, although he passed it through a variety of symbolic processes. Your material alchemist lost it. And perhaps your material alchemist was the mad parent of the entire concept of modern material science, because he certainly was one of the first to conceive of the tremendous personal advantage to himself if he could control laws for profit. If, however, he was a mystic, he would control or direct laws only for the glory of truth. And this division on various levels has endured to our present time. With the rise of modern chemistry, the hermetic tradition has more or less faded from our consideration. But this does not mean that interest in these old processes has entirely ceased. At the present time, as a fair authority on books and on rare books, I think I can say that there is still a tremendous demand, a tremendous learned reading public, <coughs> desirous of securing any material relating to the hermetic experiments of the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe. Any rare work which appears in this field is immediately purchased, disappearing again from the trade. I have talked to book dealers in this country and communicated with them in Europe, and it is rare indeed to find a rare alchemical text, regardless of price, remaining in a dealer's store for more than a few days. In other words, there's a market somewhere. The interest in these things continues, and there are people who are ready to pay $200, $300, $500 for one of these old books. The market is always 
greater than the supply. Reprints of these works are periodically made and become in their own condition rare books. And it is common, uh, common knowledge that very few even reprints of the rarer hermetic writings are available. They disappear almost instantly, not into public institutions, but into private libraries where they are variously used. Thus we have another interesting point. Ninety percent of these books are not going into the libraries of chemists, nor are they going into the collections of alchemists who have any intention of making physical experiments with the texts. They are going mostly into the collections of philosophically minded persons who are concerned with the attempt to restore the lost symbolism of the hermetic tradition. And in that respect, we might mention the work on hermetic philosophy by Mrs. Sarah Atwood, one of the outstanding rarities of the last century. A very deep and serious study of the metaphysics of Hermes, the metaphysics of the great alchemical tradition represented in Europe by several thousand valuable books, a tradition that rose mysteriously and with tremendous spectacular intensity around 1550 and was completely forgotten or at least had passed from all interest as far as the public is concerned as early as 1700. In that 150 years or less, the entire restoration of alchemical hermeticism uh, had its course. And by the beginning of the 19th century, 1800 or even earlier, these books were rare and almost impossible to obtain. Now this gives us some a general clue to a difficult problem. We have one or two other points that we want to, to make uh, as clear as possible. As we have only numbers, such as the number 42 given to us by uh, our, um, Clement, or perhaps the allegorical numbers of earlier writers who attributed to Hermes anywhere from 10,000 to 40,000 volumes or more. Uh, these numbers are not represented by any available literature. The hermetic fragments that we have today and which are clearly separate from the other groups which we mentioned, the Neoplatonists, the Gnostics, and the early Christian church, these fragments are comparatively meager, yet references made to numerous others. What happened to them? Is it true that at some time along the way these were drawn into secret societies, and that the alchemists at one time at least did possess access to these manuscripts or books? Is this possible? It is possible but belongs in the sphere of romantic thinking. We have no serious evidence. Actually, only a few texts, the Pymanda particularly, and the Asclepius, remain which are completely and unitedly bound up with this tradition. These are surrounded by a vast array of borderline literature, literature that seems to tip in almost any conceivable direction. There is even some evidence of alchemical writings uh, in the Alexandrian period in Egypt, but this uh, had not achieved uh, the interest which we know today. We are aware, however, that the Egyptians uh, experimented under the name of hermetic art with the creation of synthetic gems. We know that they were able to copy in what was later called Roman paste most of the precious stones of antiquity. And because the art of the lapidary was at that time not very well known, it is quite possible that the uh, that fraud occurred in which synthetic stones were passed off as genuine. That these creations of artificial stones, the development of certain dyes uh, for textiles and for various purposes, uh, the creation of malleable glass, or glass of itself that would bend. These ancient arts 
like that of Greek fire, are known to have had some real existence. They were included in Hermetic thinking at that time, therefore indicating that the Hermetic system was regarded as scientific and having uh, secrets useful on the level of practice and trade. Uh, this again is represented only by a meager uh, circle of uh, authority or traditional remain. How then shall we examine the books of Hermes out of the knowledge that we have of them? I think the answer lies in one direction only, namely that the Hermetic concept in itself must have had a school of some kind surrounding it, that these books appeared and remain simply isolated fragments of literature is inconceivable in the mind of the time. For in those days it would have been very difficult for any scribe to have remained concealed. It was, no long, it was not then possible to follow publishing procedure. Uh, these manuscripts had to have been circulated among at least a small group of friends, devotees, or dedicated persons who were at least partly aware of the facts. Thus this literature uh, could not have simply uh, appeared and not have had any foundation in realities. In our discussion of the Pymanda, which will come later, and which perhaps should have been introduced at this point uh, in the planning of the series, but it wasn't, so we must uh, follow the pattern, uh, we have some uh, interesting thoughts. In the Pymanda, we have a general concept of universal procedure, a concept partly paralleling that of the Greeks, perhaps somewhat paralleling that which was later to become Gnosticism, and to a little degree at least, paralleling the early theological speculations about universals held by the Christian fathers. Uh, very early, the church drew to it a certain number of scholars, and these began to speculate outside of the jot and tittle of the approved canon. And uh, the mind of man, once it has reached a certain size, cannot be uh, further pressed back into an old pattern so the church had to be prepared for men thinking forward rather than merely backward. This change in perspective uh, in the various fields of learning is important to us because about the time that we attribute to the creation and circulation of the hermetic writings, we find the basic hermetic concepts uh, beginning to influence thought outside of the school itself. Uh, we are told that Hermes, for example, wrote upon astronomy. And we can only pause to realize that uh, Ptolemy of Alexandria, who was perhaps the greatest astronomer and geographer of the ancient world, and also the father of most modern astrological speculation, that Ptolemy's works move from the same premise of that of the Hermetic uh, revelation. In other words, Hermes' universe is rather closely associated with the later developments of Ptolemy. The concepts of geography and navigation are those of the Hermetic school and not of the other neighboring schools. The changes which took place in concepts of government and in the healing arts, the secularizing of medicine, and a variety of other subjects which uh, moved and changed the face of the Mediterranean culture. These changes followed closely after the so-called original Hermetic period, and they followed even more closely the original ideas and concepts of the Hermetic school. So we'll then uh, trace some of these ideas 
in an effort to try to show how they spread out into the literature of the time. We can see, for example, the rise of certain powerful intellectuals in the Roman Empire. It is a mistake for us to assume that the Romans were all ignorant. For from the beginning of the Roman culture to the final decline of Roman life under uh, the uh, coming of the Ostrogoths, uh, the King Theodoric, up to this period we see the continual structure of a Roman philosophy. And we find this moving through the thoughts and meditations of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, through the great hymns of the Emperor Julian, and finally to Boethius in his Consolation of Philosophy. With this, the school closes. Julian, Boethius, and Marcus Aurelius all show hermetic influence. They show the type of thinking which was peculiarly associated with that school. A kind of thinking which, while similar to Gnosticism, was not Gnosticism. Similar to Neoplatonism was not Neoplatonism, and with certain Christian elements was distinctly not Christian. Thus it is quite conceivable that down through this technically difficult period to record, uh, when, as is so often the case, historians were interested only with war and not with culture, that a descent of belief and doctrine can be traced. Now we also know that one of the introductions which we find in the Hermetic writings is this important approach to the concept of mind. Now we know that Plato, Pythagoras, and Aristotle uh, seemingly rather well exhausted our concept of the human mind. Yet in the Hermetic writings and in the Hermetic corpus we find some new aspects of mentalistic thinking. We know, for example, uh, that in most of the Greek schools, mind became an instrument. It was a wonderful and powerful means for the accomplishment of truth. Mind was therefore a kind of channel through which knowledge moved into the individual. But in the Hermetic tradition we find something that departs from this and gives us a rather different perspective. Take axiom, namely the concept that God moving into creation is creation. God moving into man is man. God moving into nature is nature. Namely the identity of the creation and its creating power. We also have Hermes giving to us one of the great principles which was later to influence uh, all our knowledge, and that is the great concept of analogical resemblances. Uh, long ago it is said that Alexander the Great, while king of Macedonia, went out into the desert to visit the tomb of Hermes, a tomb which has apparently disappeared from our present knowledge, although there are reported locations for it even now. Opening this tomb, he gazed down upon the great sage of the past, whose body and bones had moved to ashes. But he saw among the ashes the great emerald tablet, known as the Emerald Table of Hermes, which contained upon it the great hermetic inscription, which opens with the rule or law or statement, which has since become world famous, that which is above is like unto that which is below. That which is below is like unto that which is above. This parallel created the entire concept of medieval science, a science based upon the similarities of things, the idea of macrocosm and microcosm, that the universe was the great man and man the little universe, 
And while we have theoretically outgrown much of this thinking, as Thorndike explains it, it is still true that the law of analogy is operating in our lives every day as a force in our thinking and is also a powerful instrument of scientific research within certain limitations. So the hermetic concept of analogy stands out in a strange intensity. We can probably trace the thinking to earlier periods and far places, but the statement, the bringing together of the idea and its clarification seemingly was part of the hermetic tradition. Thus we have analogy and mentalism coming out. We have the hermetic work emphasizing that a man is what his mind is. That if his mind has experienced its re its re-identity with God, man is God. That mind, like the later quicksilver of the hermetist, that mind absorbs all things into itself and transforms them. That it is the agent which can never cease functioning until, until all opposites have been reconciled. That also that this mental process has a great challenge in life. Man's inevitable and eternal instinct of inquiry arises from the great destined end for which he is intended. Namely, that man can never rest, never cease his wanderings, never settle into any permanent pattern until he has achieved all that is necessary for the reconciliation of all opposites within himself and around himself. That man is therefore the reconciler. That he is the power that brings heaven to earth and raises earth to heaven. Man in the hermetic tradition is no longer a toy in the hand of destiny. He is no longer an instrument subject to the machinations of unknown forces. He is no longer a pawn of autocratic deities. Man is the master of both gods and nature. Not because of his arrogance as a person, but because he possesses within himself the power of reason. And by the power of reason, all things that are divided, broken, or injured can be brought together and healed. Thus the healing power of unity, the restoration of division, the bringing of all that is necessary to man, and his ability to use it, digest it, assimilate it, and transform it from theory to practice, all these powers rest naturally within the capacity of the individual. The great hermetic art, therefore, is man's reconciliation of heaven and earth through his own wisdom, through his own reason, uh, through the attributes of his own conscience and consciousness. Uh, the Greeks were given to numerous disciplines. They believed in training the mind. They believed in, to a measure, uh, the preparation of the mind for certain experience they hope to attain as the Neoplatonists illumination above intellect. But all of this was a strange journey homeward. It was man ser searching for a truth, searching for a reality for the salvation of himself. The Hermetic philosophy shows different principles and these principles were to gradually emerge and mingle with the latest streams of humanism. For in the, in the Hermetic art, man was not only capable of redemption, he carried with him a tremendous responsibility to redeem. He had a job. He had a work. And it was the great labor of his mind to reveal to him his work. One of the purposes for which intellect is given to man is that that man may discover his own job. This is a rather practical way, perhaps a little homely way of saying it, uh, uh, devoid of fine Greek, but it is the principle involved. That man was not here to leave here, as some taught. That his existence in this world was not a penalty for sin. That he had not fallen from a grace into a disgrace. 
that he was not merely here because he was in prison and that we all shared a common guilt or we wouldn't be here. Nor was his primary end to escape here, to leave this place and to return to some far distant land in the terms of Neoplatonism. The real purpose of man was to assert the universal mind over nature, not as a tyrant, but as a gardener. And in one of the alchemical books of Hermes, we have the hermetic gardener in the garden. This hermetic gardener is not there merely to enjoy life. He is there to keep the weeds out of the garden. He has a job to do every day. It is his duty, therefore, to pick the weeds of false knowledge out of the garden of truth. It is his duty to see that good things are well fertilized and well cultivated. It is also within his province uh, to be a kind of Luther Burbank, uh, to be able to improve the qualities of plants. And we have another hermetic axiom, namely that art perfects nature. In this axiom, which later became one of the outstanding keys of the hermetic alchemical philosophy, it is assumed that skill in man becomes the skill of God working for all things. Thus the individual who goes forth and improves something plays God, just as the individual who goes forth to destroy anything plays devil that each individual has the right and the power to have a divine participation in the improvement of things. That it is not his duty nor his uh, place to simply wait until deity does all things. Rather deity expressing its primary power through the potential wisdom of man Deity releasing its own mind through the human mind forms of all humanity one mind for the accomplishment of its own works. Thus the Hermetic philosopher, if he wishes to assume that Hermes is this mind personified, may well say that this mind is the author of all books, the author and original of all knowledge and perhaps most of all, the patron of all skill, and that the greatest of all skill is this skill of transformation, this skill of uh, transmutation, by which all things are transformed from a lesser to a greater state by law, and by lawful procedures. Man becoming skillful then, in the administration of natural law becomes the preserver of his planet, becomes the perfecter of his way of life, and makes possible all other good things so that not only man but all nature enjoys a wonderful fecundity and prosperity. Hermes tells us, either as the person or as the embodiment, that all things are under the sovereignty of their superiors. And all things are uh, servants of their superiors. And that it is the duty of the superior to guard the inferior. And it is also the duty of the inferior of every level to revere and obey that which is superior. Now in the concatenations or orderly sequences of nature, man is, hermetically speaking, the chief of the animals. He is the naturally ordained ruler of the life upon the planet in which he exists. He is better equipped than any other creature visible to him uh, for the advancement and common profit of the whole earth. Therefore, man, being superior to the animal, to the plant, to the mineral, to the elemental and chemical organization around him, man's superiority gives him the right of service. It makes him responsible 
for the security of all these other things. Man has a proprietorship over everything that is less than himself. But this proprietorship is not merely tyrannical authority. This proprietorship is responsibility to serve and improve, advance and increase, unfold and enlarge, strengthen and redeem everything in nature inferior to himself. Now that was quite a concept for the time. In fact, we're having a little trouble with it now. The idea that man's sovereignty is duty, that because he possesses a certain kind of mind, he is the god of the kingdoms beneath him, and that he must be a just and righteous god, that he has those responsibilities which are similar to those which we assume God has in relation to ourselves. We assume, as Hermes explains, that the deity that we worship is all good, all powerful, all virtuous, all beautiful. Therefore, we bestow our allegiance upon that power with perfect confidence that it will not betray us. Those kingdoms below ourselves transfer a similar allegiance to us. And in any degree to which we fail to make the common good of these things our primary consideration, to that degree we are false gods in nature. All science in the Hermetic concept only exists for the purpose of equipping the individual for the service to which he was intended. Science is not to give us mastery over nature, but to give us insight into nature. By science, by philosophy, by religion, we are supposed to have the three elements of the philosophic stone, the salt, sulfur, and mercury that must be brought together, and from which comes an elixir of life, a life which bestows the healing of all things, because it arises from unity. Here there is a appearance that perhaps Hermeticism is indebted to the Pythagorean philosophy. But don't, uh, do not forget that Pythagoras declared that he gathered his numerical philosophy from Egypt at an earlier date. So where it came from directly, we do not know. But whenever Pythagoras referred to the number two, or the duad, he spat upon the ground on the assumption that it was the symbol of division and that all division is death. That it is something uh, even sacrilegious to speak the number of division. And those who speak it must cleanse their mouths. Thus all things which separate, according to alchemy, retard the projection of the stone. All growth in nature is restoration, and restoration is reunion. It is the bringing together of things separate, so that in their unity uh, they may find wholeness and wellness and fullness. But as alchemy and the later hermetists also taught, the bodies of things are not easily brought together. It is not very easy to cause an amalgam of two rocks, no matter how hard you hit them together. Nor is it easy to conceive that out of two separate human beings, the hermetic androgen can actually physically be created. Physically, things cannot be identical, having a separate existence in body. Therefore, the hermetists always pointed out that union is not to be attained in body, which, however, is not a misfortune nor in any way a retarding of the process. Before things can be united, they must achieve a victory over body, because things outwardly not to be united may be inwardly united, which is the strongest union of all. If this be true, though bodies cannot be identical,
minds can come into a common union. And out of the compatibility of minds, a unification may take place. And this may in turn lead to the final hermetic step, namely, uh, that minds are compatible. But as man uh, outdistances mind and elevates himself to a spiritual state, he passes from compatibility to identity. That in a spiritual condition, all things may be one. In mental things, or a mental level, all things may be in agreement, may find common purposes and common good. Whereas physically, all things can only be, as the old uh, masters used to so quaintly state it, in vicinity. That is, close to each other in some way, but not achieving any internal union. Hermes then gives us the mind as the wonder worker. He tells us that mind, because it is superior to body, is master of body. That the body cannot be held responsible for any corruption while it is under the sovereignty of an intellect. Therefore, that all ills, ills, troubles, misfortunes that afflict a body must be blamed upon the mind which is the ruler of that body. Therefore, that if this mind leads man or permits man to indulge in unreasonable or irrational procedures by which the body is injured, it is the mind and not the body that is responsible. Also, if through its own mistakes the mind has brought the body to mishealth or to difficulty and to sickness, the body cannot remedy the excesses of the mind. And therefore the mind must remove its own negative factor and must reintegrate its own position and must redeem its own conduct before health can be restored to the body. Even then, as mind in turn is master of body, so spirit is master of mind. And whereas mind is accountable uh, to the body for certain leadership, it is accountable to the spirit for certain obedience, for all things must obey superiors. Therefore mind is the messenger, the instrument, the intermediary, and in this sense becomes the Greek Hermes and the Latin Mercury, the messenger of the gods, the winged being that can travel into all spheres and spaces, carrying the words of the gods. Hermes, as the messenger of God, therefore is associated with his concept of Mercury. He is associated with the quickness of this deity. And in the ancient Greek legends, it is said that Mercury was more rapid even than his winged heels and helmet might imply. He was so rapid that he could circle the world in the twinkling of an eye. My Mercury was therefore the universal immediacy of mind. And also this mercury could not be held in any restraint or limitation. It penetrated walls, it went through solids, it did all kinds of things, being apparently possessed of the most superhuman attributes and powers. Obviously again referring to mind, that knows no distance and no limitation except that which it imposes upon itself. Thus in the story of mind, we have this power that can travel, can be anywhere, can be the armchair traveler who, sitting quietly beside the fire, remembers the distant lands that he has visited, or thinks of other distant places that he reads about in books. This mind can also escape from now into past and future. It can escape from all kinds of patterns imposed upon it by dogma, dogma limitations, and creedal separateness. It can most of all, if it is so minded and so inspired, attain to the free circulation of its own state. It can be itself, totally and entirely. And in being itself, it is free of everything except the duty which it owes to those things less than itself. And in the natural nature of its own being, it becomes the useful and inevitable servant. Even Hermes was aware that there is nothing more dismal than unemployment, and therefore that the mind, escaping from
from the burden of ignorance with the duties and employments which it bestows, does not escape into free space merely to become a vagrant, merely to wander around thinking about things and enjoying thought of itself forever. The mind, having escaped from unprofitable labor, chooses profitable labor. Having departed from unworthy procedures, moves victoriously into worthy ones. Thus the mind can never be idle. It can never rest. It must always move, and in its motion it must always be adventuring toward the solution of mystery. Hermes then points out that there is no mystery, except the mystery of ignorance and that everything mysterious is merely something not understood, and that it is the end of mind that there shall no longer be mystery, that there shall be no question that is not answered, no riddle that is not solved. This concept Hermes carries also to another level, namely the power of mind in the sense of its imaging propensity, that the mind is not only capable of perpetuation, and self-discipline, and all of this type of thing, it is capable of a procreative process. In other words, mind is capable of giving birth. And in the description of this process in the medieval hermetic tracts, we find many things that could well be attributed to an earlier date. The idea of the creation of the hermetic androgy the mind as father and mother of itself, the mind as a kind of Melchizedek, a priest forever, and that the power of the mind to create between its own positive and negative polarities or its male and female principles, brought together through what the alchemists call the hermetic marriage, that from this is born the homunculus or the crystal being, the infant that is made of glass, born within a womb of glass, and like Merlin, possessed of all kinds of magic. This homunculus is the symbol of man's innate creativity. The mind is not exhausted, either in learning or beholding or administering. The mind is not exhausted in the perpetuation of knowledge. Its final function is not to take that which has been known, become aware of it, and pass it on as that which shall be known. This does not exhaust the power of mind. The power of mind includes the possibility of a direct creativity, and it is because of this crea creativity that the world does not remain the same. It is then because of this creativity that the world is not merely the same kind of a garden forever. It is because of this same creativity by which the skilled gardener can improve the quality of plants, so man can improve the quality of self. And furthermore, he can creatively project from the known creating within himself tremendous instruments of imagination. These instruments of imagination have to have a validity. Imagination is not the individual actually freely generating something from nothing. Imagination is not merely a conjury of a web of insubstantial fabric. There can be no creativity without law. There can be no procreation of mind unless the image, the created thing, the new creature, is lawful. Thus, although the mind may engage in flights of fantasy beyond our conception, we have the extraordinary record that the fancies of one generation are the sober facts of the next. At the time, a novelist of the quality of Jules Verne wrote some of his wonderful books about trips to the moon and journeys under the sea and around the world in 80 days. Everyone thought him mad. They said his creativity, his imagination approach insanity. Yet these things are now sober facts. 
and down through the ages, countless dreams that have never had substance in their own time became the basis of the mature growth and development of the race or of the tremendous social pattern to which we belong. In all things, therefore, Hermes points out, there is a lawful creativity in mind. We can imagine nothing that has no relation to a fact. We may imagine a disproportion of things. We may build a daydream about futures we will not live to see. But the only reason we create this dream is because we have already recognized a need for something more than we have. We are merely projecting both our processes and our necessities. Therefore, we are bringing together procreating elements and fashioning them into a new vision. If this vision takes the form of Moore's utopia, or Campanella's City of the Sun, or Andre's Christianopolis, makes little difference. There is nothing essential in these great social visions of the 17th century which have not since been realized. Yet in their own time, they existed only in the creative power of the human mind. The creative power of the human mind may also formularize. It may not only have certain abstract thoughts, but it may weigh and estimate needs so exactly that it can create solutions immediate to problems imminent. <coughs> this means that certain minds have the power to go beyond the common acceptances and to achieve certain things. There were thousands and thousands of good parents who realized in an abstract way the need of their children's education. They knew that there had to be a way to bring essential knowledge to the young. But from among these parents, Amos Kominsky or Comenius came forth with a creative concept of an exact method. And that method has given us the modern public school. These things existed as dreams first. These dreams are sometimes handed on from one to another before they are realized. But dreams realized now or later, according to Hermes, belong in the fact that there is a creative dimension in the mind. That the mind not only buffets itself against the necessities of nature, but is forever ingeniously solving the unsolved problems of its own necessities. This mind then carries still further implications. And on this ground, Hermes approaches that section of his work which is essentially religious. Hermes now identifies this mind with a series of situations and he produces what is called the great hermetic confusion inasmuch as he presents to us a concept of God that is monotheistic polytheistic and pantheistic all at once he intended to actually when he created a monotheistic concept he did exactly what many ancient peoples did. And when he created a polytheistic concept, he did no more than the Trinitarians did in the early church when they made up God three persons. Actually, no difference was achieved. And pantheistic, with its implication on the, div the divinity of natural beings, also did not depart from the concepts of the Greeks, the Egyptians, or for that matter, much of our modern thinking. If there is a tendency to religion in modern materialism, that tendency is pantheistic. It is not so named or so distinguished. But science, with its tremendous exploration of energies and its discovery of ever-increasing power throughout nature, has gradually come to take an almost reverent attitude towards elements and substances and essences and principles and laws, regarding these as innumerable powerful agencies 
which it would like to control, direct, and use for its own purposes, whereas Hermes says the answer is to use them for their own purposes, which is something a little beyond us at the moment. But um, Hermes does give us a monotheism, and in this he is not different from most other ancient peoples, for it is a great mistake to regard either the pagan or the heathen as essentially a polytheistic believer. Although we may have gods for the thousands in ancient and oriental pantheons, these peoples are essentially monotheists. For monotheism is not primarily the existence of only one divine person in nature, but of one divine principle in nature. That principle being reality, truth, or God. That this one divine power manifests solely in itself, by itself, and through itself, and has no dependency upon its own creations for the expression of itself, is scarcely reasonable or logical. The most devout person today believes that he is a spark from the flame of God. He sees no conflict with his monotheism in affirming that there is a divine principle within himself. This principle within himself must be divided from other similar principles in other selves. But all of these are suspended from one common principle, the great fire from which all the sparks have come. That great fire is the one deity. The sparks are the polytheistic expressions of that deity. And nature, every part of which is filled with the life and power of God, the innumerable sparks in the atoms, in the blades of grass, in the rocks, in flowers and animals, these sparks are pantheistic in the sense that they represent God growing up through nature. They represent this one power. A medieval man denied the power in himself or the divine principle in himself to all other creatures less than himself. But today we are not inclined to take this position. We recognize that growth is the manifestation of life, that anything that can grow is alive. We further recognize that existence, the continuance of a thing without disintegration or decay, is also the proof of the presence of life. Therefore, all things which have a continuance have some kind of a life. Even dead bodies have some kind of a life. And therefore, this life, which is a continuance of existence, or is an animation in existence, with growth, with motion, with power, this life must either be God, or else there is a life in nature apart from God, which Hermes would not accept. Consequently, we live in the substance of a monotheism. As human beings, divinely ensouled, we are polytheism. And as we gaze out to the infinite vista of the presence of God in all universal mysteries, we are in the midst of pantheism. Yet these things are not essentially different. They do not contradict each other in spite of the fact that much has been made of this apparent hermetic contradiction. It is not a contradiction because it is an unfoldment upon levels and is no more unreasonable nor unorthodox than the statement of Paul relating to the thrones, dominions, powers, principalities, angels, and archangels. A recognition also of the existence of secondary powers of a divine origin but superior to man. The Hermetic tradition binds this entire problem together by placing over uh, the universe a kind of being representing the extension of divine consciousness into nature. This medial being suspended twixt heaven and earth dominion wielding is the concept of universal intelligence. 
Intelligence is less than God and more than nature. Man, likewise, is less than the totality of God and more than the totality of nature. Man has powers above nature, but he is subject to powers beyond himself. This median power is the instrument by means of which the sovereignty administers the world. This power is intelligence, wisdom, knowing, learning, or reason. A man has become peculiarly, by his position, the embodiment of this reasoning agent. Everything above man has a faculty uh, beyond reason. Everything beneath man has power or faculty less than reason. Therefore, as man ascends, he moves from the reasonable to the intuitional, to the inspirational, and to the illuminal. As he leads downward from reason, he goes down into instinct, into sense, and into attributes, reflexes, and sensitivities which he cannot really understand. <clears throat> Thus man possesses this reasoning power. This reasoning power, however, is also in motion of its own accord. The power of reason is not forever the same. The power of reason, apparently, is subjected also to a kind of growth. Reason moves upward as all other things in nature. And this motion of reason is clearly set forth in the vision of the Pyamandris. This motion of reason is also indicative of man, for man is gradually moving through reason, from its least to its greatest parts, even as he is moving in philosophy, uh, from Theosophia Practica to Theosophia Theoretica. He is moving upward from objective, obvious things to things more real but less obvious or less objective. This motion is his natural growth. And this motion is the releasing of his power to act as an intermediary between heaven and earth. For this reason, Hermes and many other hermetists and mystics do not accept the idea that man is simply an animal standing on its hind legs. Nor will they accept the famous old platonic definition uh, that man is a biped without feathers. Uh, there is something uh, more to this than meets the eye. Man is divided from the kingdoms beneath himself by a quality which these kingdoms possess in potency only to a limited degree. In the animal, <coughs> reason is potential. And to certain animals, the rudiments of apparent reason or manifesting reason may be dimly traced. But man is the only creature, the only reasonable creature that can build an empire. He is the only animal that can wonder where it came from and wonder where it goes. He is also the only animal that can look at the sky and determine to conquer it. Man has proportions and dimensions within himself, a great uneasiness. If this uneasiness was in the beast, he would have taken the world away from man. But because man possesses this uneasiness, possesses this constant pull, and is moved toward the continuous improvement of himself, Man is gradually learning the magic of his own mind. He is learning, however, that this mind is governed by law. He is learning that this mind is something for which he is accountable. That unlike the concept of modern humanism, he is not lord of all he surveys to do as he pleases, but only to do what must be done. He has the right to do as he pleases only because he has the power to do so. And in having this power and exercising this right, he does that which is contrary to law. He falls into adversity. And here we have the, the hermetic concept that what we call the tragedy of the world, the tragedy of life, the misery and misfortune with which we have burdened our own kind is man exercising 
or attempting to exercise a kind of free will which is without foundation in value. If he continues this exercise, he may do as he pleases for a time or within a certain pattern, but the laws which he has violated will turn upon him and destroy him. He is not merely a mind in vacuum. He is not the type of being uh, conceived by doing. He is not the person for whom all the world is his oyster. He is not the individual for whom all the world is a slave. He is not merely here to gratify. And while he attempts to follow such a procedure, he is in trouble and will continue to be in trouble. He is here primarily to understand, to become the hermitist, to become the alchemical master. He is her here to learn the secret way by means of which all imperfect things may be redeemed, including himself. He is here uh, for the purpose of becoming the master of the hermetic arts the uh, capacity uh, to play God to nature even as he bows humbly to the God of nature. He is therefore exercising toward a divine state and it is because of this reason within himself that man has creatively projected the concept of deity. Deity in its own inevitable existence is unknown to man. Man's only possible assumption is that it exists. Man cannot define it without defiling it. But man instinctively recognizes the total sovereignty of something. And this is partly due to the fact that he instinctively experiences the potential of the total sovereignty of himself. Therefore, that phase of mind in which all things are possible becomes a very interesting thing. The question was once raised theologically, and this is a nice point. Does God perform miracles? There was a great question over that problem. A number of theologians affirmed that because he was God, he could perform miracles. Another group said no. The mere fact that God is God does not permit him to perform miracles. Then the third group came forward with a very pithy quotation from scripture which sort of settled the argument. They said, frankly, there is no need for even the speculation as to whether deity can or cannot perform miracles. Because it is stated in the scripture that with God all things are possible. Therefore, where does miracle come in at all? If God can do anything, then there is no problem of miracle. Because the all doing of God is of the nature of God and therefore not miraculous to God. And as he can do everything and anything, there is no requirement of an action beyond his common nature. This was a very interesting point of argument. But it is very reminiscent of our hermetic problem. For Hermes envisions this kind of a deity in whom, in whom no miraculous or exceptional action of any kind is necessary. For the common works of God are themselves sufficiently miraculous. There is no requirement for man to consider that he lives in a universe beyond law. There is no assumption that he lives in a universe ruled over by any temperamental or eccentric factor. For in this universe, universal mind, moving into its own creations and becoming identical with them, moving forever, moving into all parts of its own nature, and, I, and establishing itself in the midst of itself on all levels, becomes the kind of alchemical garden for it is stated by the Hermitus that the seed of immortality is present in everything. The alchemist declared clearly 
that they cannot manufacture the elixir of life, the philosopher's stone, or any great thing. They can only take the seed of it, which is present in everything, and help that seed to grow through art. Thus, by art, anticipating and advancing nature. Hermes would have said this, universal mind is locked in everything. Its lesser expressions are the habits and forces peculiar to various types of life. Its greater expression is the reason within it. Its greatest expression is the consciousness within it, which is the master of all its reasoning processes. Therefore, it is not that man shall create these things, or shall exercise a strange and mysterious power, unique, but that man represents one kind of God serving another kind of God. One condition of deity administering to another condition of deity. And that the mind with which man saves life is the same mind as is in the life which he saves. Therefore, all processes are deity working upon deity. All creatures are God manifesting among gods. And over this sovereignty is mind. Therefore all things are attainable by mind because mind is all things, in all things. And the various operations which we call nature may be understood because the very understanding by which they operate is identical with our understanding by which we understand the operation. This goes into many abstract phases of metaphysics. But it does give us certain clues and certain keys, and I think constitutes the essential burden of the general phase of the Hermetic literature. It cannot be rescued from a single book. It cannot be taken from any one group of fragments. It must be taken from 1800 year survey of the existing changes, modifications, and specializations within the descent of this tradition. But because these things are in it, and because men of many ages, including the fathers of modern science and philosophy, were aware of this tradition, and many of them were addicted to it, we find its principles surviving in our thinking, and through us, whether we realize it or not, will survive to the world of the future. So I think that perhaps is a good point to bring it to a termination this evening, before everyone gets a little too exhausted with that part of the divine mind which he is using.